talking about check all that apply in sensory analysis. So welcome back folks who are following the sensory analysis class at Niagara College and welcome to our friends from all over the place who are watching these videos with us. Um, check all that apply is a really quite straightforward method in some respects and in other respects the data analysis can get a little bit finicky and so we're going to have two parts to this video where I actually talk about uh, some of the data analysis and how to manage uh, what appears to be quantitative data and turn it into, uh, or what appears to be qualitative data and turn it into quantitative data using some different uh, macros in Excel, and that's that's a, a more interesting topic. But uh, let's just jump out here. Uh, following the very same pattern, you may get you may get a little bit of deja vu here. But honestly, this pattern's very very similar. Every time we're doing sensory analysis, it really comes down to knowing when is the analysis really the appropriate technique for the questions that you need to ask. Sensory analysis is all about asking really good questions and then following and using a well-established method to get the results you need to answer your question. So we're going to identify where check all that apply or CATA analysis is appropriate for your sensory analysis. We'll define how we can use CATA to help in the food product development process. We'll describe what's required for a CATA sensory setup, including setup, labeling, and script. We'll, uh, we'll actually look at some uh, questionnaires as well. We'll determine an appropriate data collection method. We'll interpret some CATA findings using frequency tables and Pareto analysis, and we'll, we'll discuss the use of Excel and VBA macros. And that will be actually a part two video because I think uh, just going through how to upload some uh, different macros is going to be enough of a complex topic. We can do some basic CATA analysis using some survey tools that uh, we'll work through in just a moment here. But uh, it, this is just one type of sensory analysis. And so we've, we've walked through a whole bunch of different varieties. The key question here is we need to think about the attributes that are important or perhaps that aren't important when looking at products within a certain category. And so there's lots and lots and lots of words, but those are converted to frequency tables. And then that can be turned into quantitative data. And so many times the students that I work with, they've been trained as, I don't know, winemakers or brewmasters, or they've taken uh, food and wine dynamics courses where they spend a lot of time talking and, and describing attributes. Well, now what happens if you stick a whole lot of people in there and they're all describing their attributes at the same time. We want to now start to capture that data which started off as qualitative data and turn it into quantitative data so that we can make sense of those numbers. So your hypothesis can be in the present. So the here and now, you put a food product or a beverage in front of someone and you take the time and you say, what do you observe in this product? What attributes are there? And tick them off. It could be in the past, so you could be asking questions. It's not a liking question, but you can say, what attributes are important in strawberry jam? I'm just looking across in my office, and there's a jar of strawberry jam on the, on the bookshelf. What attributes do you feel are important in strawberry jam? Now, and now, doing these where you don't have a product in front of you can be a little bit misleading because oftentimes consumers say they want a certain attribute, in a product but they don't actually like it and so oftentimes you're doing check all that apply but you have to link it to another type of preference or hedonic testing. You can also use it from a future a forecasting perspective. What attributes do you think you would want to seek out in a product? And inevitably it's got to be linked with prototyping where people will say oh I want to see more I don't know lemon flavor in my strawberry jam. That might work or it might be disgusting but People often think about what, what would be cool, and you need to link it with actual prototyping and link it with hedonic testing. And so again, just like so many of the methods we've been spending time on, oftentimes doing one form of sensory and one hypothesis testing leads us to find another type of study to do with additional quantitative or qualitative methods. And so that's why there's 
constant opportunity in sensory analysis and lots and lots of opportunity for people who are curious. And I always say this, I'm taking this from a really pragmatic and user-friendly approach for product developers. There's so much more you can study and I highly recommend if you are really enjoying this to study more and make a connection with some of the sensory analysis experts that are out there. So why would a food scientist care about this? Well, this is often used at the discovery and ideation phase. It helps us focus in on what's important and meaningful to consumers. What attributes are people actually picking up? I, I think of uh, some of my friends at Niagara College are experts at wine tasting. And oftentimes, uh, oftentimes they'll do wine tastings and they'll, they'll pick off attributes that sound beautiful and wonderful and luscious and delicious within the products. And then oftentimes they'll bring beverage products over to me because I am, despite the fact that I have a, a, a really strong background in um, consumer product development and so on, I am, I am not a trained sommelier. And so I don't pick up the same attributes in food products. I, I have a breadth sort of experience in sensory but they, they, they call me the archetype soccer mom, except that my, my uh, kid is more into kayaking and rowing than soccer. <laughs> but I'm, I'm more of an archetypal standard consumer when it comes to tasting products. And I don't pick up on the attributes. And so that's something also that's important. If you put that product in front of a bunch of experts in the field... Are they going to see different attributes than a bunch of naive consumers? And I, when I say naive, I don't mean that they're, that they're ignorant and silly. I mean that they just don't have the insider expertise that you might have working in the sector and seeing that product and all of the rich diversity of product and the minor defects that could be occurring. Sometimes those attributes are picked up by experts, but they're not picked up by the general public. And so that's something that's important to note when designing these sorts of surveys. Who are you administering the survey tool, or <laughs> administering the survey tool to, and will they find those attributes or not? Now, I learned about this, and this is a friend of mine, her name's uh, Amy Bowen, and she is a world-renowned uh, sensory analysis expert, and she has done some fantastic studies using the check all that apply um, as one of the major tools. And, and I just wanted to tell a little bit of background about her project where she was working on apple breeding and she works at Vineland uh, Research and Innovation Center, which is in the town of Vineland, which is uh, one of the neighboring uh, towns to our campus. And what she did was she presented consumers with all sorts of different apples and paired the attribute analysis, so check all that apply on these different attributes, so redness, sourness, sweetness, crispiness, crunchiness, um, uh, the texture of the skin, all of these different attributes, she lined those up and then matched them to rank preference on different apples and how much consumers enjoyed the apple. And using those paired analyses, she was able to then work with apple breeders and be able to design even better apple varieties for uh, Canadian consumers. And so she was just honing in on some of the, uh, some really great analyses, disaggregating based off of uh, different um, experiences uh, in life. And just, a, a, this is who I learned it from. And honestly, Amy's been really fantastic person for me to learn from. I oftentimes students say to me, oh, well, you have a PhD, you know everything. Oh man, I, I'm i learning new stuff all the time. And I can't stress that enough. Explore and keep on learning. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, watching these videos is part of your own learning journey. When I go and talk to Amy, I learn stuff all the time because she is just phenomenal at what she does. And rest assured, there are some fantastic sensory experts out there that know this stuff inside and out really, really well. So how are you going to get this set up? Well, normally in a CAT analysis, you're going to have around 40, possibly upwards of 80 untrained participants participating in your sensory study. Now, again, that's not always feasible for small business. The cost of doing that is sometimes prohibitive. But if you are doing an analysis and you want to have really good statistics on your data, that's a typical 
on the small side number of participants. Again, you're going to profile them for relevant lived experience. And sometimes you may have demographic profiling so that let's say, for example, if you were doing Apple analysis, would people from uh, different immigrant backgrounds have different expectations of apples? Um, or if you were a child, would you have a different expectation than if you were an older adult? These are the sorts of uh, key questions that are important to determine based off of the characteristics of your product. Sometimes when you're doing this, it's common to have key opinion leaders be in that check all that apply. But again, opinion leaders or experts in the field may pick up on different attributes than an average consumer. And so do be aware of that and think if that's going to somehow provide useful information or if it's going to lead you off on the wrong direction and do you need more average sorts of people to be in that um, definition. Now typically you're going to do it in that traditional sensory booth setup but we're seeing more and more virtual sampling and more and more um, experience where uh, sensory analysis groups are sending samples home because of COVID and what we're finding is that the practicality of that is, is actually quite good. People are able to participate in their time and space and, and do it in a way that's less stress for them. And so as such, they're giving better results and they're responding better. So there's a lot of interesting, but honestly, the, the, I don't think the sensory booth setup's gonna disappear. There's a lot of control that can be had by doing it in that setup and you can minimize a lot of the variables within the environment. We've talked about that in some other videos. Now, the strategy for Check All That Apply is that you need to think about what those pre-existing attributes are going to be. And oftentimes you're working with an internal team to define what those attributes are. In some cases, there may be actual flavor, pardon me, flavor parameters set up. So, for example, I work with a lot of beer professionals and the beer industry has judging criteria for different beer products. And so you may be picking those attributes from existing flavor wheels or existing flavor criteria or sensory criteria. But it's important to make sure that when you're setting up those attributes, they need to be meaningful. When you're describing them in words, people who are reading those words need to know, oh yeah, when you say crispy, this is what you mean by crispy. When you say buttery, that's what you mean by buttery. Um, and that people understand that attribute appropriately and would be able to describe it in their own terms. Like uh, I think of I think of when people say this cheese is flabby and uh, and and I often shake my shake my arms and go, does the cheese have bingo wings or, or something of that sort? Uh, thinking of of a fitness level, the words have to be meaningful. The other thing is those words have to be in the order of sensory experience. And so, for example, if the first attributes that you think someone might um, observe in a product would be visual, then you'd want to put color or transparency or um, some of the visual things that you may be seeing on that product then maybe it's odor that's next. So what are you smelling and, and listing those attributes next? You want that list to be in a functional order that's meaningful so that you can, you can see it and it makes sense to the end user when they're doing it. You don't want them jumping back and forth in that list and missing attributes as they're going about it. So Oftentimes, there are these wonderful aroma wheels and uh, sensory wheels that have been established. This is a wine one, and, and honestly, the wine and spirits industry have established some really great descriptive um, lists of different, uh, different flavors. Now, I mentioned before, are these flavors meaningful? Would I know as a, as a naive end user what gooseberry smells like or what Madeira smells like? Not exactly sure, so do make sure... Think about who that end user is. And, and, and if you feel it's an important attribute, you may actually have a training sample. So if I felt that gooseberry, which is a little bit obscure for many end users, if I felt that gooseberry and, I don't know, acacia and oop, fern were important uh, 
aromatics within that product. Maybe I need to get a piece of fern to pass around or a piece of fern for everyone in their booth to quickly do a reference check so that they know what that smells like. And in many cases, you will have trained or semi-trained analysts participate and help define what those descriptors are in the first place. But again, I can't stress this enough. Make sure that whatever you are using is meaningful to the end user. There are other wheels that are out there. So here's a wheel for egg. And the attributes that we're seeing here are very different than what we saw in the in the in the wine one where we've got more uh, we've got dairy type of notes. We've got fruity notes and eggs. I have no idea, but you can build out these wheels, honestly, for any number of different products. I've seen them for chocolate. I've seen them for um, you, you name it. You, there, there's likely a wheel out there and that can help you build out an initial vocabulary. But if you're presenting the, the sample to a, uh, if you're presenting that sample to an expert panel, yeah, they may be able to handle 30, 40 attributes. If you're sending it out to a uh, population from the general public, they can likely handle 10 attributes. More than that, and they're going to start to get confused and lost in that list. And so think about, again, who's participating and how many attributes is realistic for the participant to, to identify. Now, Again, what we as industry insiders may deem as important may not be the same as consumer impressions. And so we really need to think about what is important and are we recruiting the right population to participate? The other thing is that oftentimes these, uh, these attributes are prompting people to think they want something and... At the same time, it's not what they are actually enjoying. I think of wine labels and the fact that they're using attributes to try and sell wine. And they'll say, with luscious notes of blackberry and banana. Um, and using all those attributes as a means of upselling the product. I realize that's sort of off topic for our sensory. But when people are given those lists of attributes, they're often prompted to look for things that they wouldn't otherwise notice. And so... Um, what consumers think they want and, and uh, using the vocabulary in a really strategic way, you need to make sure that you're not trying to prompt your participant to look for attributes that aren't necessarily there because they sound desirable and because they sound important and would make this product more of more value. And so what consumers want and what they really want are not necessarily the same thing. So oftentimes you're going to have that product in your standard sensory setup. I've got my tray here with my um, palate cleansing uh, unsalted crackers. I've got a cup of water. I've got my samples in labeled cups. In this case, we've got a randomized three-digit label. We're a pro or providing appropriate cutlery and napkins as necessary. And it's on a neutral colored tray. We've, we've talked about different ways of labeling products. Sometimes people will be given a questionnaire paper or a placemat to help position their products. In other cases, um, the product may be presented in context. So I think of having cereal in a, in a sensory analysis and they gave us a bowl of a, a small cup of cereal, but then they also gave us some milk so that we could see how the attributes changed when we presented that product in the proper context. Now, I'm going to actually jump out. This is uh, a, a friend of the college, uh, Chef Thomas Heitzen. He happens to be a corporate chef at uh, Kraft Heinz Canada. And he did an activity with the students where we were doing some work with salad dressing. As you know, Kraft Heinz is one of the world's largest salad dressing producers. And we actually did some CATA analysis. And so I actually built out a survey tool so that we could talk about salad dressing with Chef Thomas. And um, so... Gratitude to Chef Thomas and his team um, for doing some of this work. And at this point, I'm just going to jump right out to the survey tool that we built. Because what we did first off is we lined up a whole bunch of different salad dressings. And we just said to the group, let's talk about what attributes are important in salad dressing. And think about what flavors, what textures, what visual attributes are important so that we can make our CATA analysis here. So that's just, uh, I'm going to jump right out and not edit this. There we go. 
So we did a check all that apply example, and we did it on ranch salad dressings. And as you know, Kraft Heinz makes some fantastic ranch salad dressings, and we brought out a whole bunch of different ranch salad dressings uh, from Kraft Heinz just to see what we could see. So you'll note my first question in my survey tool is just a preamble giving some risk benefit statements and giving some instructions about participation. And again, I always say this is important and I don't want to ignore the fact I, in some of my videos, I don't put these slides in, but just to reinforce the fact that it's important to make sure anyone who's participating in your sensory knows what they're up to and knows that they're going to be able to manage any risks to them. Then we've got our, our additional allergen statement here before starting. Please make sure you have no allergies to dairy, soy, egg, fish gelatin etc and ingredient declarations are available for each product yes i have no allergies of concern etc i'm willing to eat ranch salad dressing with vegetables and one of my cl claims here was no i'm unable to eat ranch salad and but i will because this was part of a student activity i didn't want any student to say well no i can't do this but i'm going to just excuse myself from the class so i mean i forced them to be able to do that no, look at the data set <laughs> it was the was the opposing answer here. Jumping out to the check all that apply, we we did some some quick attribute analysis, and these were the attributes that we felt were relevant to our ranch salad dressings: creamy, white, zesty, acidic, smooth, chunky, garlic, yogurt, chives, bacon, mustard, pepper, and I did give them the box other, and so they could fill out on their own any other words that they felt were important for their attribute analysis. And guess what? All we did was check all that apply and we repeated that same attribute list across a few different samples. So we had sample one, two, three. I realize I should have done a better job randomizing, but uh, sometimes I just put placeholders in. And if I'm doing this for real, I'm gonna do proper random digit codes for my samples. So the same attributes as before, Creamy, white, zesty, acidic, smooth, chunky, garlic, gar yogurt, chives, bacon, mustard, pepper, other. And repeat, 789. Oh, oh that's not a three-digit code. That's me being lazy. And then guess what? We did a rank preference on these samples. And so we had a rank preference question where they could have their most favorite, their second favorite, their third favorite, and least favorite. And last but not least, how much did you like? So note... We're able to do some kata, but then we're quickly pivoting to make sure that we had the right attributes, and not just attributes, that we weren't just linking those attributes, but we were able to link it out to opinion and belief and uh, overall liking about this. Oh man, well, I've got a column six there. I've got to fix that. Let's remove column six there. Just to show you in this, it's a multiple choice grid and we set up our rows and we set up our columns and it's pretty straightforward to work in Google, uh, in Google Forms. There's lots and lots of tools on how to structure different questions. And for those of you who are in the class, I share these uh, templates with you so that you can uh, use them for reverse engineering your own survey tools. Um, so let's carry on here. And last but not least, how do you feel about the level of creaminess? Oh, we threw in some just about right questions just for fun. And then a thank you note at the end. So what does this look like when we did some data analysis? Just jumping out to our responses tab here at the top. Clicking on the responses tab, we've got some summary. And obviously our first couple questions were just the, the survey questions on um, health and safety. You can, if you've got... Um, if you've got the right uh, questions, you can use a logic framework. So if it says, if you responded, no, I have allergies, you can set it so that the survey tool says, thank you very much uh, for your health and safety. Please don't participate. And it closes the survey. But in this case, we didn't set those questions that way because I wanted the students to participate on all of these different survey tools. But what's great now, let's jump out here and we've got the check all that apply. We, as let's say we worked at Kraft Heinz, just, just uh, to tease out uh, some different scenarios, we may have market data. We may know sample one, two, three is the market leader and has the greatest sales volume out there. 
that could be an important piece of information that's missing here, but that could really frame this discussion. If we know sample one, two, three came from the market leading salad dressing, ranch salad dressing, we know based off of this that people feel that the attributes that are important are the creaminess, the white coloration, the chunkiness, the garlic, and the chives and onions. And that is really useful. If we jump out here and we take a look at the different samples, we've got a sample that's very acidic and chunky and has really prominent black pepper attribute to it. Then perhaps the next sample, we've got it's very white, it's very acidic, and it's got a dominant chive and onion flavor. And to a lesser extent, creaminess. We can see very quickly, these are the attributes that are really jumping out for the different panelists. Creamy, garlic, yogurt, chive, and black pepper. And we can, we can, uh, we can quickly see which was the most favorite. Well, one, two, three was the most favorite product. We can go back here and say, based off of that rank preference, one, two, three was the favorite product. Creaminess, along with white, chunky garlic and chives. Those are attributes that are going to be market leading attributes. And so depending on who we are, if let's say we are, this is Kraft Heinz, but perhaps we are now working on the, let's say private label account for Loblaws or Sobeys or, or so on. We may say, you know what, these are the attributes that are really important to our consumers. We want to make sure that the formulation we come up with is creamy, white, chunky garlic and full of jives, because sometimes copying is really important. In other cases, you may be saying, well, wait a second, I need to go blue sky here. And we're noticing that in all of our market samples, bacon, bacon, why is there no bacon ranch here? Hmm. And maybe we are going blue sky and saying, from a ranch perspective, where we, th we know that bacon ranch is a very popular sandwich flavor maybe we need a bacon maybe we need a bacon ranch salad dressing with bacon flavor because there's a blue sky opportunity here and none of the ranch samples that we're presenting have that baconness and so each of these angles could be really a really unique perspective on the sort of data analysis now we don't have any liquor or just about right uh, responses but the nice thing about some of the different survey tools that you use, such as Google, uh, Google Forms, it will do that basic analysis for you. And you can quickly do some summary about the data that you're seeing. Now, I do have a second part of this survey or not survey, a second part of this analysis. I can take the data from here and I can click on this um, little green square. It looks like a little green present, but that's not a present. It's, it's a, it's a spreadsheet. And I can, now I have suddenly all of these cumulative tables. And so based off of our responses on this survey tool, I can see that panelist number, panelist number two, I realize uh, row number one is my headings, but panelist number two said creamy, white, acidic, chunky, garlic, and mustard. Now, here's my key question. If I'm in Excel, how do I go about counting how many times the word creamy showed up here? And so I actually am going to do a second video and show you how to do uh, frequency word tables so that if for some reason you needed to do more in-depth analysis or do more uh, data segregation, um, how would you be able to do that? And so that's going to be part two to this video. I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint here and find uh, Chef Thomas smiling at us. He's a great guy. If you ever have the chance to meet him, you will enjoy it because he's so much fun. Anyways, I do want to encourage you. I know that all of my sensory analysis um, slideshows are ending with this slide, but I, I keep saying it. Just, just go out and try it. Honestly, the tools for setting up surveys are so accessible. Anyone who's got internet is going to be able to do a survey tool in next to no time. I always joke with my students that uh, um, oftentimes when I need to figure out if I can do something, 
I just go out and do it. But then I'll often do it with my with my kid. I've got a teenager at home. And if my teenage kid can do it, then then I trust that anyone can do it. And we were making some survey tools about Pokemon and it was it was just hilarious. The the tools are getting more and more intuitive. And I just I just want to stress, just go out and try it. Um, have some fun with it and honestly experiment because that's how you learn and the more you experiment and have fun in the process if you're doing it knowing that um, if you're not under the pressure of having to do it because you've got a huge uh, multi-million dollar account or you've got you've got a final exam if you're just doing it because you're having fun you're going to learn and you're going to absorb it and then when you do land that product development director's job and you've got that multi-million dollar account and you're doing it, well, you'll have had the experience of, of doing it before. And so I can't stress enough, just find ways to de-risk doing these activities and, and enjoy it. If you're, if you're not having fun, do something else. I just hope you're having fun doing some sensory. All right. I look forward to your questions and I will be following up with part two, which is going to do some more advanced work with Excel to figure out how to do uh, um, taking qualitative data and turning it into quantitative data. All right. Talk to you again real soon. Bye for now.